I'm, uh, I'm real pleased to have uh, Dr. Joyce present this morning. I've already introduced him to the crew, crew several times, so I won't get into detail, but uh, he's uh, our new shoulder faculty and doing a phenomenal job building practice here. And uh, I'm very excited to hear what he has to say about where we're going to be at the shoulder capacity. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks so much. Hopefully, you guys can hear me okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics here, or maybe favorite topic in orthopedics, which is uh, anatomic shoulders. Um, so first of all, I know most of the people in the room at this point, but I'll tell you, take 10 minutes or so to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, just my favorite topic. Uh, and then uh, in between my last job and my current job, I, I took about five, six weeks to go out to Europe and do a little bit of an observership uh, fellowship kind of thing. So show you a little bit about that and kind of what I learned there. And then we'll talk about uh, the present and future of anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, first of all, uh, I really want to say I'm like truly honored to be part of this department. This, is, uh, this has been awesome. It's really a dream job for me. Uh, thank Dr. Brocky for taking a chance and hiring me. Hopefully, it pans out okay. Um, and then also to uh, Bob and Peter for uh, really being awesome mentors for the first couple of months and uh, pushing me to be better constantly. And uh, it's it's been a lot of fun so far. So a little bit about myself. Um, so I grew up in Chicago uh, for high school, and then I went to uh, University of Illinois. And this is actually my senior picture. I uh, don't really know what I was thinking that day, uh, but anyways, had, had a good time there. Did actually uh, uh, majored in general engineering there. Went to uh, medical school and you thought I would have matured a little bit, but um, obviously I didn't. Um, and I don't even know why I did this, but I'm a pretty good looking bald guy, I think. So maybe I've got that in my future. Uh, and go Buckeyes. Then uh, again, I think I would have matured a little bit going to uh, residency, but um, also did not uh, too much there. I went to University of Colorado for residency, uh, finished there in 2019, and then uh, went to Philadelphia at uh, Rothman Institute at Jefferson. And um, this is the COVID mustache. So there were, there were four fellows, and uh, one of them was uh, female, and we had a facial hair contest, and I actually was second place with this, which is kind of unfortunate, but uh, anyways, uh, those are in the past a little bit. So as I said a little bit before, um, after fellowship, I joined a uh, private practice in Denver. I was there for about two years, um, did probably about 70% shoulder elbow, a lot of trauma, a, lot of, a little bit of general stuff, some hand and uh, sports stuff as well. Um, came to Avalanche Dam while I was there, I guess. And then, uh, uh, which I'll talk about in a second here, in between that job and uh, coming here, I was able to take about six weeks to go out to France and Switzerland and visit with some shoulder uh, shoulder surgeons out there. And then uh, this is me here. You can see I'm super happy and excited. This is, uh, uh, you know, to be here and um, be at Utah and uh, see where the future lies. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, I do exclusively shoulder elbow now. Um, it's a picture of my uh, wife and kids. I've got three daughters. Um, I'm uh, clinically, I'm at uh, UOC one day a week in clinic and Farmington one day a week in clinic. And then I split OR time. I'm at the main OR one day a week. Uh, and my other OR day, uh, sometimes at UOC, sometimes at Farmington. And then I do go to the VA as well. Uh, about two to, two to three days a month. Uh, so clinical interests, uh, you know, really, I, I do everything shoulder elbow related. Uh, I think my particular interests I, I listed here. So arthritis, complex and revision arthroplasty. Um, those are the things that, uh, you know, that's why I went into shoulder elbow and that's what I really like doing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I also take care of rotator cuff tear, shoulder instability, uh, elbow arthroscopy, elbow arthroplasty. And similarly, my uh, research interests uh, kind of align with that as well. Um, anatomic shoulder arthroplasty is, is really a passion of mine, as we're going to talk about today. Um, also, reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and then uh, uh, figuring out problems and uh, solutions for irrevocable rotator cuff tears. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to take five or six weeks to go out to 
Europe um, when I finished up my last job and uh, between there and starting here. I uh, did a week in Nice, France, and, uh, yeah. two weeks in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and then two weeks in Yes. I'm on right now. So uh, <clears throat> first stop was Nice with uh, Professor Pascal, Pascal Boileau. Uh, so I, I, a lot of people might have heard his name, especially in the shoulder world. He's a, he's a real... Uh, innovator in shoulder, you know, in the last like 40 years, he's really one of the top names in shoulder uh, surgery in general um, and a really nice guy. And it, you know, it's just awesome to learn from him. Um, he's been a, a real pioneer in implant design over the last like 25 years or so. A lot of the implants that we use today are based on some of his designs along with Gio Walsh. Um, and then he's also developed a lot of uh, surgical techniques that we're using or that have really come and gone. And, um, some of them that still persist. This is a picture of us. And then Dell. Dell was a, a visiting fellow from the UK uh, while I was there. This guy had like, I don't know, at all times, at least four visiting fellows with him. Um, so this is a picture of us uh, having lunch one day. So our, our typical day there, he, we would do like four cases, five cases. He worked like three or four days, so four or five cases in the morning, um, mix of stuff. And then we would finish up, walk across the street, have lunch, have like two or three beers, um, or glasses of wine or whatever, um, as you can kind of see here. And then we would go back to clinic afterwards for like six hours. Uh, I, I don't know. I have to work as hard as he did, I guess, while we were there, but um, he's figured it out. Because he's been doing it for a while. And then uh, everybody else here. So uh, there's a couple um, year long uh, fellows from Columbia and then uh, another fellow from Mauritius, but uh, nice, nice crew there. Um, so as far as from my perspective, I learned here. So in, in clinic, um, it's probably where I learned most, honestly, uh, just seeing his take on shoulder pathology and his physical exam. Uh, this is him doing a gauge test on the left here for uh, hyperabduction. And then this is a picture of a guy that had a cuff tear. Um, and he puts people in this like 90 degree abduction race for four to six weeks, which is, Nuts. I don't know if that would really fly here, but people listen to him and he's got good results. So maybe we can learn from him. Um, and then I put this picture on the right here. So yeah, I took, I don't know, dozens and dozens of pages of notes, but you would just kind of stop clinic and then just write down like, hey, this is what I do. So this is what it does for massive irreparable cup tears. Um, just really awesome experience there. <clears throat> and uh, in the OR, uh, this is mostly observing from uh, my perspective, but Again, he's kind of a, a pioneer with a lot of these operations. So on the left is a bio-RSA. Uh, it's basically doing a reverse shoulder replacement with uh, using the humeral head as um, autograph to give lateralization. Um, and then a couple pictures of his arthroscopic lighter J, and he was one of the pioneers of that. Um, we saw a handful of those while I was there. And then um, arthroscopic capsule application there as well. Um, some other tidbits that I took from the OR there. So. Uh, First of all, uh, the, the room temperature, I don't think ever dipped below like 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It was really cold, especially standing there in scrubs. Um, this is the, the highest I saw the blood pressure ever, like the entire week I was there. It never went above 80 degrees, or uh, 80, uh, uh, the systolic blood pressure never went above 80. So they've got something figured out um, with arthroscopy. And then the other thing is, um, so I feel like I take a lot of pictures. I'll take like 25 pictures sometimes and just printing out sheets. He, take, he took 191 pictures in this case, which is just, I, I don't know. Again, he's the master though. So maybe we can all learn from that. Um, and then obviously did a little bit of sightseeing. Nice was awesome. Um, very interesting city. Uh, kind of went between French and uh, Italian occupation over the last 800 years or so. And, um, and that was nice. So after Nice, uh, my next stop was going up to Geneva, Switzerland. And this was with Dr. Alex Lederman. Uh, he's, at, he's a professor at uh, Latour Hospital there, um, president of the Swiss Shoulder Society. Uh, very, very involved in research um, and uh, always pushing the envelope with that. He also sleeps like three hours a day, which is pretty crazy. So I was there for about two weeks. So I put these pictures here. Um, so I showed up, I, I'm like, you know, emailing back and forth with him and his English is pretty good, but there's a lot of miscommunication there by email. And he's like, show up at the train station, I'll pick you up. I'm like, great. And this is on August 1st. 
Um, so I show up at the train station with all my bags. He picks me up and he's like, hey, uh, it's Swiss, Swiss National Day. I didn't realize that, so we don't have clinic today. And I was like, okay, great. He's like, we're going to go to my dad's lake house and uh, hang out there. So <laughs> he took me over to his dad's lake house and we had like this huge party. And uh, you can see they, they made me feel at home by putting an American flag up there. And um, we uh, put this one works, but served raclette, which is just cheese. That you just like melt cheese and you just eat cheese for hours. <laughs> it was an experience for sure. And we were up till probably like two in the morning, drinking and uh, you know singing, chanting Swiss national songs and that sort of thing. Then we woke up at like four thirty because we had to bike fifteen miles to get to work the next day, um, which like. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't feeling great, but I was excited to <laughs> uh, hang out with him. And um, this is just some pictures. And it wasn't like on the road, it was like through fields. We stopped, he's got like a beehive somewhere. We stopped to like feed the bees. And it was just, it was nice. And that was like my first 24 hours with him. It was good experience. Um, so I didn't take as many pictures because this was like a whirlwind two weeks and I was scrubbing in and helping and really doing some of the cases with him. Which was a great experience as well. But um, you know, we saw a lot of different procedures. He does uh, open lighter jays and does it differently than what I'm used to. And I've actually adapted my style to doing pretty much how he does it, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a procedure that he kind of pioneered, which is the DAS, which is dynamic anterior stabilization, where you take the long and the biceps tendon and split the subscap and attach it to the anterior leg. Remember, Never done that, probably will never do that, but it was interesting to see. Now, I took, I took this picture of the, this kid here. So he's six weeks out from Ladder J. His thing is he has everybody do push-ups in, in his clinic at six weeks, which uh, again, I haven't adapted to that, but um, just feels confident in his, uh, his repair there. Um, the other thing is, uh, they, you know, I, I guess you think like, okay, yeah, Switzerland's known for its cheese, but like it's everywhere. So this is the OR fridge. Yeah, I opened up the OR fridge and it's just cheese. And this is like at the end of the week, at the beginning of the week, the whole thing. Cool. And then this is a picture of a guy that's, uh, you know, an hour out from his surgery and they serve you cheese, like a block of cheese. It's just, it's just nonstop. And then, so we would, we would work until like 9 p.m. And then, uh, and then we would go out on his boat on Lake Geneva. And this is uh, not me doing wake oil, which is awesome. Uh, and then I tried as well, but not much of a water sport guy. And this is about as good as I got here. Stood up kind of. Really well. <laughs> Anyways, it was just uh, nonstop. And then we would sleep for three hours and go back the next day. Um, last stop was Bern with uh, Professor Matthias Schumstein. Um, Bern was an awesome city. I don't know if anybody's been there before. I'm sure some people have, but. Uh, very uh, old kind of medieval city, uh, super, super pretty. Um, and uh, this guy's uh, very involved in research and societies, uh, but also uh, very involved in high level sports, especially on the Olympic level. This is a picture of the whole team here uh, with these partners and some of the residents and research staff and uh, everybody was great. Um, he was actually an Olympian, he was an Olympic handballer, uh, which is pretty cool, but he ends up seeing like all the uh, upper extremity uh, Olympians. This guy here on the right was, uh, he did Schwingen, which is uh, like a, a type of wrestling that's uh, native to Switzerland. And I, this picture doesn't do it justice. This guy was like 6'10 and just a total monster. But uh, anyways, uh, saw a lot of that. And then in the OR, uh, good variety of cases here. Uh, latissimus, torsi, tendon transfers, posterior uh, blown blocks for uh, posterior instability of the colonoid and, and from there. Put these pictures in there. So uh, he worked with a bunch of the residents, and the, the dress code for residents there in clinic was a little bit different. It was just kind of t shirts, and, and, uh, and maybe we can work from that. Uh, and then did a couple of days of sightseeing afterwards. Switzerland's awesome. Uh, you know, this is the uh, Matterhorn, and then the uh, Eiger, Monk, and Young Crown all up there. Uh, but awesome city. And, and really, you know, for me, this experience. It was great, learned a lot, uh, surgical techniques and uh, uh, ways to uh, approach patients in clinic. But uh, you know, for any of the, the residents, trainees out there, I think doing something like this is awesome. You guys have it built into your residency to some degree, which is great. Doing this after being in practice for a couple of years was even better because you kind of start to realize what you don't know and I think you can appreciate a lot. So it's something to keep in mind for the future. 
So now I'll talk, uh, uh, get to the real talk here, talk about anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. So um, <clears throat> try to keep this somewhat interesting because about two thirds of the uh, audience here doesn't care about these, but um, uh, I love them and uh, you should care about them. But um, anyway, so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the trends over the last 10, 15 years or so in shoulder arthroplasty, uh, talk about the reverse, why we're doing it um, and kind of where we're going from here. And then what are some of the current uh, problems with anatomic shoulder arthroplasty and why people are kind of going away from it. Uh, and then look at current research on anatomic versus reverse uh, and try to figure out which one's better. Uh, and then really most importantly, I think is what is the future of the anatomic and what can we do to make it better here at the University of Utah? So some of the trends in shoulder arthroplasty, um, this is a, a more recent study uh, that looked at trends from 2012 to 2017. Um, and you can just see on the graph, the blue is the reverse, the orange is anatomic, and the gray is hemiarthroplasty. So hemiarthroplasty is kind of going away at this point, uh, so from about 12,000 cases down to uh, 5,000 cases. But if you look at reverse and anatomic, so people are doing more anatomics than they were 10 years ago, but um, if you look at the trajectory, reverse has gone from 22,000 cases in 2012 to 63,000 cases in 2017 over a five-year span. That's, that's a huge increase. Well, anatomics increased about 10,000 over that same time frame. Uh, you know, so when you extrapolate this out to today and you look at some of today's data, reverse is really taking over. And if you're looking at primary arthroplasty, so most of those are percuffed intact patients, um, well over 75% of primary arthroplasty cases today are reverses. And that continues to increase um, and really the biggest thing, which I think is astounding, is this went from 35% to probably about 80% today. Um, you know, so why are we doing this? I put this slide up here, maybe capture everybody else's attention in here that doesn't do shoulder arthroplasty, but uh, what all these things have in, in common and what pretty much every other joint in the body, what we're striving to do is recreate anatomy, um, except in the shoulder. It's really the one joint that we're we're continuing to stray farther away from an anatomic reconstruction. Hip, knee, elbow, even in the spine, we're, we're trying to recreate anatomic motion and, uh, uh, you know, anatomic uh, muscular forces and everything like that. Um, so why are we flocking to an implant that uh, is not anatomic? This is even coming from really the father of modern shoulder surgery, Charles Neer, he said, in the future, Basic designs of the articular surfaces should remain the same as normal anatomy. No biomechanical theory can improve on anatomical design. Uh, and obviously we're, we're kind of moving away from that a little bit here. So what is the reverse? Pretty much everybody here has heard of the reverse at least, but I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to explain what it is and why people are uh, loving out these days. So on the left is your standard anatomic total shoulder replacement. Uh, you replace the straightforward, you replace the ball with the metal ball, and then you replace the socket these days with polyethylene, uh, ball cemented poly, or something along those lines. But the socket becomes a resurfaced polyethylene socket. On the right is an example of reverse, and you reverse basically. So the ball is going on onto a base plate that screws into the uh, glenoid. And um, the fixation there is a little bit more solid, but, uh, and then on the on the humeral side, you get the socket basically that's going to rotate around your uh, glenosphere or, or the ball there. Um, the reason that this really came about um, is for patients that have non functional or massive rotator cuff tears, the ball becomes decentered. So when you don't have a rotator cuff and you have a normal humeral head or you try to put an anatomic replacement in somebody, you have what happens on the left. So there's no cuff to counteract the deltoid, which is a straight, basically superior force here. Um, so what the reverse does is it adds constraint to the system and it allows a stable pivot point. And so even if you don't have a rotator cuff on the right, when the deltoid fires, it's locked in at that pivot point and the whole arm will move up. Um, so the, the original indication for this was rotator cuff tears, rotator cuff tear arthropathy specifically. 
but really, especially over the last like 10 years, um, those uh, indications have expanded. I think that's probably one of the main reasons that the uh, number of, the, of reverses being done has increased so much. So originally it was just for cup tear um, People now are using it for massive cup tears without arthritis, uh, or cup tears with pseudoparalysis, um, and then revisions from anatomics or hemis in the field. Um, one thing that I, I think we'll talk more about this kind of throughout the, the next half hour or so, but <clears throat> the reverse has better fixation to bone based on the implants we have right now. Um, and so for patients with severe bone loss, especially posterior or superior bone loss, um, when you put in anatomics, they tend to fail pretty quickly. So people have really flocked to doing reverses for these cases with severe bone loss. Um, and then proximal humerus fractures is another thing, uh, you know, in elderly patients, patients with poor bone quality, patients with head split fractures, um, there's pretty good data out there that doing reverse will give you a better long-term function um, compared to the fixing them or doing like a hemi or a total arthroplasty for those. Um, so why else has it become popular? Um, so when you do an anatomic, if your rotator cuff tears 10 years after you do it, then the implant will be on a slow course to failing, um, like you see here. Part of that might be because this implant's super overstuffed. It's not my own. But uh, um, anyways, but uh, if you do a reverse, you don't have to worry about that because you're sort of bypassing the need for the rotator cuff by constraining that system. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily say it's technically an easier operation, but it's a more reproducible operation and it's, um, it's easier to get right, I think. So I think a lot of surgeons, especially, you know, if you go across the country, people that are doing five, 10, 15 shoulder arthroplasties a year, it's a little bit easier to uh, recreate the same operation every time. And if you're off by a little bit, it's more forgiving than if you're off by a little bit in the anatomic. Um, and then the uh, long-term revision rate for these long-term is like, 10 to 15 years because we haven't been doing these for that long in the US at least. It's, it's pretty low so far from what we've seen. So people have continued to flock uh, towards doing reverse because of that. So part of the reason is the anatomics aren't doing as well. Um, and there's some problems with the anatomics that we have not solved. And uh, take a couple slides to talk about this. So really, the number one issue with anatomic shoulder arthroplasty, um, in my mind, and I think in, in most shoulder surgeons' minds, is loosening of the glenoid. And we have not figured this out. This was a problem, you know, 50, 60 years ago, and it's still a problem today. Um, so we're primarily putting in all polyethylene cemented components. And uh, what we're starting, what we see is loosening the implant. And the idea is that uh, the shoulder has a lot of play in it compared to some of the other joints in the body. And you can start to rock that implant loose, which is what that top image is showing there. That can be on an anterior posterior level, but also a, a superior inferior level. It's really just a three-dimensional level. Um, the other thing that we saw, especially like 15, 20, 25 years ago, is uh, we're trying to replicate some other joints and get uh, metal backed implants and these failed uh, pretty miserably, at least with the first generation of implants. Um, you got some backside polyethylene wear that led to osteolysis and metal debris uh, and blood <coughs> loosening and, and uh, pretty bad defects actually. So um, this is kind of a history of what anatomic glenoids have looked like over the last uh, 50 years or so. So the one on the far left, this is uh, Dr. Near's first metal on poly um, shoulder replacement, anatomic shoulder replacement. This is pretty much the first of the modern types of metal on poly uh, total shoulders that were done. <clears throat> and he used a keeled uh, type implant, which is uh, the bottom left picture there. And uh, the idea here is it was cemented into place. He had to take out a good amount of bone, but it was metal head. <laughs> and we started to kind of move on from that design a little bit um, and use all pegged uh, glenoids. This allowed for uh, less reaming of bone, uh, supposedly better peripheral fixation. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the, in the last slide, people went on to 
look at metal bag splenoids to try and get bone ingrowth into the implant. The idea is if you grow into the implant, then it should be stable for longer at least. Um, these tended to fail. And this was one of the first generation implants. You can see it's a flat back here. And the, the, the forces that that implant are gonna see are, are basically straight shear forces, which led to these uh, failing uh, pretty miserably in a lot of cases. And then more recently over the last 20, 25 years, um, we've had some new iterations, but the implants, the clonoid implant really that we're putting, that I put in yesterday, looks very similar to what we were putting in 40 years ago. Um, with a couple of exceptions, but uh, better uh, interference fit on some of the peripheral pegs. Um, the bottom right picture is a picture of an uh, augmented anatomic glenoid to make up for some posterior uh, bone loss defects. And then the top right, these are some uh, newer design implants. And you know, I think where some stuff may be going in the future, time will tell, but uh, there's, a, there's hybrid glenoids with a hybrid of uh, smaller ingrowth surface, and then you peripherally cement. Uh, a newer age, uh, newer generation metal back glenoids. And then uh, the top right is an inset glenoid. So again, these implants see a lot of shear force. And this implant is uh, the entire poly is actually um, inset into the glenoid to help counteract those shear forces. Um, so talking a little bit more about glenoid loosening um, and why this is a problem. The uh, study on the left, this is a lower volume study, but this is one of the <laughs> studies that has good long-term long radiologic outcomes. Um, the, uh, basically, in these 44 patients, there was 84% implant survivorship, which is pretty good overall. But when they looked at patients that actually made it out to 20 years, so most patients, uh, the implant out survived them, but um, all the glenoids were loose at 20 years based on radiographs. And uh, again, this is just radiographic. Most of them were still in place, but this is a problem. I, I, you know, all glenoids probably will become loose the way that we're putting them today at some point. We just don't know when. We don't know if it's become symptomatic. Um, the, the study on the right, this is uh, looking at the first generation of metal back glenoids um, with longer term follow up. And you can just look at that graph. That's like a graph that you don't want to see in orthopedics uh, as far as survivorship goes. But um, by 12 years, uh, the survivorship was 46%, um, which is pretty awful. And when these things fail, they fail miserably with a lot of bone loss and it made for a very difficult problem. So you kind of think this is awful. Like, why are we doing this still? Why did I do one of these yesterday? Uh, it's not, it's not all that bad. Uh, there is a light out there, I guess, somewhere, but, um, so the, the study on the left here, so this is looking at the insect blown away. Um, and this is mid to longer term follow-up, greater than six years. Um, and it's 21 patients, which is a small study, but zero revision, 0% zero glenoid loosening. Uh, the one issue here is the first author designed this implant. So, you know, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but um, it's certainly something to consider moving into the future. Uh, just a quick tidbit. One of the, the reasons people don't like these uh, implants is you have to ream away some of your precious glenoid bone um, to get that implant in there. And people worry that you're actually reaming away more bone than you need to. Um, so yeah, on the right, so this is a, a larger group. This is looking at hybrid glenoids. So again, hybrid glenoids, the idea with hybrid glenoids is there's uh, some sort of center uh, metal peg or something along those lines that has an ingrowth surface on it. And then you cement it peripherally so at time zero, you've got good uh, stable fixation, but it allows for the bone to ingrow over you know, the next six to 12 weeks. So this study, looking at hybrid glenoids had pretty, pretty good, uh, and again, the follow-up was two to nine years, so not real long-term, but pretty good um, data. So radiolucent lines just on x-rays were about 8%, and then frank loosening was 0.1%. So uh, maybe somewhere that we can go in the future. And their survivorship at five years is uh, 97%, which again, is pretty good. <clears throat> um, so all in all, uh, with the way that we're doing anatomic clinics today, this is still an unsolved mystery. Um, at the same time, you know, I think the biggest issue with glenoids is loosening. Um, not all loose glenoids may be symptomatic and there's some other treatments. It doesn't mean that you completely failed at that time. Um, but I do think that, especially as we start to look at some of these studies with longer term data, 
Um, I think that flonoid loosening likely contributes to long-term uh, decline in function. Um, so another issue with doing anatomic glenoids is, uh, or anatomic total shoulders is traditionally you do this through some sort of subscapular <laughs> so take down, whether it's tana, <clears throat> excuse me, a tenotomy, uh, peel, uh, or an osteotomy, and then you have to fix that back to the implant uh, because if that fails, then your implant will fail essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, uh, on top of that, if, so if, it, if the subscap doesn't heal, then the implant will fail early. Um, and I think there's also some level of subscap dysfunction with these, even if they do heal. And, and what we do know about the shoulder, especially in uh, total shoulders, is if the subscap is uh, weak or poorly functioning, the overall function of the shoulder is very poor. Um, Another issue is uh, attritional rotator cuff tears. So again, uh, people get rotator cuff tears as you age. Um, you know, I think like 80% of people over the age of 80 have full thickness rotator cuff tears, whether or not it's symptomatic is uh, another question. But if you have an anatomic shoulder replacement in there and you develop a rotator cuff tear later on, um, that implant is going to be on a slow course to failing uh, or loosening the glenoid because of the rocking horse phenomenon. Um, this was a, a study uh, with Dr. Matson. So they, it was basically a registry study looking at 4,000 uh, patients with complications, and they were just looking at the numbers here. So the, the number one issue in this study, at least, was one of loosening, that was 20%, uh, and rotator cuff tears was 15%. Um, so I wanted to look at uh, data that's out there right now and see which of these is better and uh, do we actually have any good data that's out there? So um, I, I really, I wanted to focus on um, two studies here uh, that in my mind probably capture things as, as best that we can right now. Um, and then we'll kind of critique these studies a little bit. So this was a, a multi-center retrospective match cohort study. So this was in the exact tech uh, database. So it's a database study, and again, with one implant. Um, but they had 370 anatomics that were matched to 370 versus by age, uh, gender, and uh, comorbidities. Um, and then they had uh, just two-year follow-up. Um, and again, two-year follow-up, hard to know if these things are, uh, what these are doing 10 plus years out. Uh, but when you look at their, their outcomes here, uh, basically anatomics and reverses at two years functionally did the same. You know, if you look, really look through it, maybe anatomics did a little bit better at two years, but they were basically about the same as far as functional scores are concerned. Uh, but uh, rotational motion was significantly better in anatomics compared to reverses, specifically with external rotation. Uh, it was 52, 53 degrees versus 38 degrees. Um, and then when you look uh, through these patients, there was similar complication rates, similar satisfaction rates, similar... Uh, revision rates overall. Um, and, you know, I think it's important here, yeah, I keep kind of dogging on this stuff, but the overall patient satisfaction is 94%. Again, this is at two years, but people still do well with both of these implants. We're just trying to figure out which one is better. Um, you know, so some of the limitations I kind of alluded to this, probably the biggest limitation here, um, again, it's one implant. It's everybody that's on this study is a designer of that implant. So there's some bias there for sure. Um, but this is only two-year data, and, and one way loosening is something that happens in 10 years, 15 years, something like that. So it's hard to know how these people are going to do long-term. There's really not a lot of data on that. Um, in my mind, I think this is one of the better papers looking at that. This is with their cut uh, in Florida. Um, this is, again, it's retrospective, and this is specifically looking at patients that had eccentric wear in their glenoid before any sort of uh, implant was placed. So they had Walsh type B or C glenoids, um, and they looked at patients that were treated with the anatomic and patients that were treated with the reverse. The anatomics were placed, no augments or anything like that, and they reamed down the uh, high side of the glenoid to make it an uh, anatomic version, and then reverse was replaced. And then they had done a previous study that looked at outcomes at two years, and then they followed these patients out to seven plus years, and I think the average follow-up was like 10 years or so. Um, so looking at the patients here, uh, again, this is retrospective. The reverse patients uh, were a little bit older, and um, the, uh, the glenoid 
wear patterns were a little bit worse actually in the reverse patients, as you can kind of imagine, because uh, there's more of a predisposition to, <laughs> to reverse that, but um, somewhat similar. But again, the, the B2 type clonoids were about 95% of the anatomics and only about 75% of the reverses. Uh, whereas the, the B3 clonoids, which theoretically is a little bit worse, uh, there's a higher percentage in the reverse. So um, when they kind of looked at this, I think this graph shows a lot here. So the middle column there, so the, the left column is the preoperative functional scores uh, and range of motion. So top left is ASCS, top right is simple shoulder test. Uh, then the bottom two are active elevation, active external rotation. The middle uh, column uh, is the two-year follow-up data. And then the right column is the final uh, follow-up data, which again was on average about 10 years out, um, but minimum seven years out. And the light blue is anatomic and the dark blue, green, whatever it is, reverse. So if you really, if you look at the two year to the final follow-up in functional scores and range of motion, but really specifically most functional scores, the functional outcomes of anatomics really dropped off pretty significantly over that five to eight year period. Whereas if you look at the reverse column, that dark teal, whatever, um, it really, it stayed about the same over that time frame. And functional scores at the final follow-up was actually better in reverses than it was in anatomics. They also looked at revision rates here um, at, the, at the final time point. Um, the revision rates of anatomics was 8%, revision rates of reverses was 2%. Um, revision rates with some of these is, is a little misleading. So if you have an anatomic in there, you have, you have another surgical option to, to put a reverse in somebody. If you already have a reverse in there, your revision um, options are a little bit limited. So I'm always a little bit weary of these uh, revision rates, uh, but this is obviously a little bit different. Um, and as you can see, there was a significant decline in function and range motion uh, by seven years in anatomics. Uh, whereas it, you know, if you looked at their original paper, anatomics did better than reverses overall. Um, <clears throat> so in addition to these studies, I mean, these are just some of the other ones that are out there. Um, all in all, these are, these are all retrospective. All the data we have on anatomics versus reverses is retrospective. Um, it's by and large short-term outcomes as well. It's like two to five years. There's a handful of studies that compare the two um, with longer-term outcomes, but it's, it's limited. The common themes, what I take from this is that I, anatomics uh, and reverses seem to have relatively similar functional scores. Um, especially earlier on. I think anatomics have better range of motion earlier on uh, and lower vision uh, reverses have a lower vision rate, however, the longer term. And this is something that, uh, you know, those, those of us treating elbow or sorry, shoulder pathology uh, keep in mind. So, you know, when I'm talking to my patients, I have this discussion with them and tell them, you know, I don't think this implant, if I'm gonna do an anatomic, I don't think this implant is gonna last forever. Um, but it's probably going to give you better motion early on. And there's patients that come in with really bad arthritis that have very good motion. And I worry that they might lose some motion with reverses. Um, so this is kind of, again, to summarize what I take from the current literature um, in patients with, again, all those patients, those prior studies were rotator cuff intact patients. Um, patients with uh, intact rotator cuff, uh, when you do an anatomic, I think they probably have better function or at least better range of motion for the first five to 10 years. Um, but I think that it starts to decline somewhat rapidly at some point. And I think that's probably because the glenoid starts to become loose uh, in my mind. Um, reverses uh, from what we can tell. And again, the reverse was FDA approved in the US, at least the, the yeah, the reverse in 2005. So we don't have like great long-term data, long, long-term data in the US. Um, but the function seems to, to stay pretty constant over 10 plus years, um, and there are lower revision rates. Um, but when you, again, you take a kind of a step back and look at these, they both have very high patient satisfaction. Um, survivorship traditionally is pretty good, uh, even with antibiotics. Um, like I said, we still don't have good long-term data uh, since the is uh, maybe 20 years old yet. All right, so this is... Um, this is what I kind of really want to talk about here. So the future of anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty, what are we going to see over the next 10 years or so? And uh, what can we do to make this better as well? So um, 
first of all, I, I kind of alluded to this, but the, the research we have currently is not good, um, at least at comparing anatomics and reverses. Uh, everything's retrospective. Um, really, to answer this question, we're kind of grasping here, but we need a larger volume prospective randomized control trial and that hasn't been done yet. Um, there's some people that have tried to do it, but it's it's difficult to do. Um, Got to find the right patients, and then really why this is difficult is people don't like being randomized into two different types of replacements, and having that discussion is difficult. But we are uh, actually part of a, a group that's looking at this right now, so hopefully we'll be able to answer that in a couple of years. Uh, the big issue here, as I kind of alluded to before, is um, we need to improve the, the problem of colonoid loosening. And I think there's a couple of ways to go about this. Um, so improved implant design is one thing. I, I, I talked about this a bit. There's not enough data to really um, you know, look at these things uh, real critically, but insect colonoids uh, is a possibility. Hybrid colonoids is a possibility. There's also newer generation metal-backed colonoids. Um, so the first generation, uh, designs, as I mentioned, had pretty high failure rates. So really shoulder surgeons across the world are like very um, diverse to uh, doing metal back glenoids because of those outcomes. <clears throat> Some of the newer um, designs have better, better uh, porous ingrowth capabilities. Um, they're smaller uh, uh, footprints on the backside, and then they're they're also not straight vertical. They're, they're, they've got more of a concavity to them. And there's some data coming out with those, at least early data that, that shows that there's some uh, possibility there. Uh, one of the other uh, things that I think we can improve on, and, and Keith and I were just talking about this beforehand, um, is alignment of the glenoid. So traditionally people, uh, they just put an anatomic glenoid in, it's a resurfacing, right? So wherever the the glenoid is lined, you just resurface it and you put a polyethylene liner right on top of it. Um, but anatomically, uh, glenoids are typically superior, superiorly inclined five to 12 degrees or so on average. Um, and if you kind of imagine that, if your implant is somewhat superiorly inclined and the head wants to ride against that, you're going to have higher shear forces. And this was proven that with Heath's uh, uh, shoulder simulator, um, when they looked at uh, joint uh, compressive forces and shear forces in patients that had uh, neutral or specifically a 10 degree in inferiorly inclined glenoid, um, these forces were lower, especially compared to people that had 10 or 20 degrees of superior inclination. Um, so I think this is something that uh, we can improve on. Um, despite this awesome study, most shoulder surgeons in the country, probably the world, don't ring down the inferior glenoid and correct the version, or sorry, correct the uh, inclination of the implant. Um, but possibly this is something we can look into the future, or possibly uh, augments, but augmenting the superior glenoid, um, something like that. Um, Subtract dysfunction, I, I think this is probably a bigger issue than people realize. Um, you know, one, there's one issue if the subscap doesn't heal that usually fails pretty early, but I don't think a lot of these subscapularis uh, repairs function super well long-term or they may start to lose function over time. Um, and there's a couple ways that we can improve on that. So uh, improving our repair methods, um, be more diligent about repairing it with multiple sutures, possibly using anchors, something like that. We've all toyed with that. Um, or just avoiding doing a subscap takedown at all. Um, I haven't tried doing this yet. There's a couple of surgeons that have done this. Uh, Dr. Chalmers is uh, doing a study of patients um, looking at subscap sparing approaches. So the, the problem with subscap sparing approaches is you really want to make sure you have good visualization of your joint to remove osteophytes, release tight capsular uh, attachments, um, put your glenoid in the right position. And if your subscap is in the way, um, it's really hard to do that, uh, but there's a couple of described uh, methods of either taking down part of the subscap or leaving it uh, intact altogether and doing the entire operation through the rotator interval between the subscap layers and the supraspinatus. Um, this is just one of the uh, studies looking at that, and it's just the, the best title for a paper. Uh, just make the rest of us feel like 
we're not that great, but uh, anyways, he, but he said, well, I could do that because he's uh, really one of the best surgeons in the world. Um, so my personal take on this, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm obviously relatively new at this. I think that anatomic shoulder arthroplasty will always have a role in shoulder arthroplasty. Um, but as we've seen, that role is decreasing. And I think it's going to be continuing, continuously decreasing if we don't solve some of these problems. Um, and really, the, the big problem in my mind is glenoid loosening. And uh, you know, some of my future research directions uh, want to, I want to look at trying to solve that problem. And um, realistically, it's hard to with the data that we have, it's hard to stand in front of a group of shoulder surgeons and say, you should be putting in anatomic shoulder replacements because our data is not great. And the data for reverses is great uh, or good. And, um, you know, time will tell what will happen with reverses over time. Um, there's, uh, like I said, I mean, we haven't been putting these in the, these newer implant or newer uh, design reverses we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. And who knows what these things are going to do in 20 years? We might have a problem that we can't fix. Um, so, I, you know, my practice, I still do a lot of anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. I do believe that the early five to 10 years, maybe 15 years, is probably better with anatomics for cuff intact patients. <clears throat> but it's harder and harder to uh, to back that up with the research that we have. But hopefully, you guys learn a little bit, and uh, happy to take any. Questions or comments or concerns? I have a question. Um, the question is how consistent are the designs or how similar are the designs? Uh, for each of these classes, and the, the differences within the groups, is there a meaningful variation in outcome? The differences in designs in each of the companies have for a reverse. I know that all of our doctors will use one company, of course, and not another, and they have their reasons. So there must be some differences. And are those, can those differences blur the um, the distinction between these two in files. So you're talking about differences between different reverse designs? And, and anatomic. And anatomic. So if you see one anatomic, you see them all? I think you see one reverse and you see them all, or there is enough variation in design with each of these broad classifications. So it's hard to say at the end of the day that a reverse is always the one that's better than anatomic or vice versa. I think you're right, and I kind of alluded to this, the, the data that we have on this is not great. So when you look at reverse design, they are uh, still very different, I think. Um, so there's kind of your original, like, called the Grammont style. So the, the main difference is, at least on the humeral side, um, is the inclination angle of the reverse. And then if you're doing uh, an inlay or an onlay, uh, component uh, on the on the glenoid side, you can talk about how much lateralization there is of the glenosphere. So there is still a very large difference in how we're implanting reverses. Uh, I think you know people still argue about that to this day, and uh, you're right. I mean, they're not apple, it's apples and oranges within the reverse group, and um, it's hard to study that, but. Um, everybody's got their, their thoughts. As, as far as anatomics go, probably the majority of what is being implanted out there is very similar. You know, there's some differences as far as using a stem or stemless. I don't think that really matters too much, um, at least from what we've seen so far. Uh, people are basically trying to make the head as anatomic as possible. There is a little bit of difference on the uh, clenoid side. So, <clears throat> The biggest difference is here uh, to kind of summarize this. So typically what, what I'm doing, what, what we're doing here is we're putting an onlay resurfacing polyethylene uh, glenoid in, and that's at least four millimeters thick. So you're adding four millimeters to whatever's there. 
um, and it's sitting on top of the surface and that's seeing a lot of shear forces. And I don't think that's going to be the answer long term, but that's what we have now. Um, the biggest differences, I think, are you can inset the glenoid, so you can ream away bone and put the entire glenoid inside, glenoid component inside, which helps with your shear forces. And from what we've seen, has pretty good outcomes, but then you're reaming away bone and there's really not a lot of bone in the glenoid. Um, or there's using metal to get ingrowth. And, you know, there's, there's different thoughts on this. Most people aren't using that or they're just using a metal peg in the center, but um, they're, they're different. But I think when you look at these, the anatomics by and large that are being put in, I think are very similar, maybe with the exception of insect glenoids. The reverses, they're different. And each of these studies, those two different studies that I went through in a little more depth, those two reverses and those two studies were very different implants. One was an onlay medialized glenosphere uh, implant, and the other one was an uh, inlay humerus and a lateralized center of rotation. So it's hard to know with what we have. Um, you know, I, I alluded to this before, we're, we're trying to do this prospectively and in a randomized fashion, it's hard to do, um, but hope we'll have better answers. So the, the, the main point here is that if you use revision as your index, and you've got five different ways of doing the glenoid, and two different ways, maybe you three different ways of doing two or three different ways of doing the, the first. It, it is challenging to know what the differences are between those two groups, because there may be a really good anatomic in there that's uh, somehow the signal is, is wiped out by the noise of the other hand, or vice versa. Yeah. Chris, you know, my thought on this is obviously you can see the trend of reverse popularity, and research and industry are going to follow that more than the shallow slope of anatomic, right? So, like, even in our own discussions, like, with teeth, like we're talking about optimizing the reverse more than anything. And we're talking about bone preservation and like stepless reverse and inlay reverses to maximize motion. So do you think that like, despite even best efforts of saving the anatomic, it's gonna be able to keep up from an industry and research perspective? Um, I don't know, that's a good question. I mean, you're right, uh, getting grants and stuff for anatomic research is not as easy as reverse research. Um, and uh, it's probably going to continue to be that way. There's a couple of reasons. I mean, reverse implants are about twice as expensive as anatomic implants as well. Um, the data is pretty good. But, uh, you know, I just, something I didn't really allude to in here because we don't have much research but uh, looking at this, but we have our functional scores that, that look at these patients. But there's something about when you see your, your, reverse patient that they don't, they still don't have as good a function sometimes, I think, as an, a well done anatomic does. And I don't think those functional scores necessarily capture that a little bit. Um, but you're totally right. I mean, there's a huge push towards that. Um, I just, uh, you know, we worry that two things. Number one, I don't think the, I don't think the function range motion is better right away. When these things go bad, they go pretty bad versus instability, uh, bone loss. I mean, like you can get to a point where you have an unsolvable problem pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's where everything's trending for sure. Yeah, just to follow up on that comment, Chris, about the you know, functional outcomes. The MCID is uh, the best paper, the most comprehensive paper I've seen is out of the exact type of groups that have seen database. They were showing functional MCIDs of three to 10 degrees. So your patients are picking up or perceived to pick up a three degree improvement in, in range of motion, which I personally don't bite into. It seems like that's a little too, can you slice that pie? Um, so <coughs> keep that in mind when you see these functional stores and you see the improvements, tons of ceiling effects. Everybody seems to get better because you know how to hold it. You notice when you do that again. So it's this. <coughs> You know, all or nothing sense of what these scores mean. Um, that's one of the things we're starting to doubt when we're going to work together is how to pick these things apart. We've even seen it in some of the scores from the reverses. It's everybody gets better, but when you take it down, you start to look at the individual components within the scores. 
you can actually see what patients start to differentiate. And so none of these scores is really ideal just yet, but where we're maybe going in the future is trying to connect part these and maybe have a reverse specific score or a functional specific score. I I hear Peter and Bob talk a little bit about they call it stuff like during the subs gap after a reverse. Mm -hmm. Does something like that address some of the rotational problems that, that you see with reverses? No. The short answer is no. It's a stability yeah. thing, not a yeah. not a motion thing. So the the it's hard to know if repairing the subs gap does anything. I, I think it does. I think it if you repair the subscap and it heals, you improve internal rotation. I think we've shown that. It might help with stability. In theory, it would help with stability because you've got something else preventing the implant from dislocating anteriorly. Um, I'll tell you that most uh, studies that look at that um, show no difference between the two. But if you look at how many times you repair the revert or repair the subscap and it actually heals, it's pretty low. It's probably like 30%. Um, so you are probably not really comparing two things. Personally, I think if you, for a cuff intact patient, if you repair the subscap and it heals, that's going to give you probably a better outcome. It doesn't heal. Um, but you're right. And every single one of these studies, they don't take that into consideration, much less if it's healed or not, because to really check that, most people aren't doing osteotomies for reverses. You have to do an MRI or which is hard with metal in there or an ultrasound or something like that. So uh, we don't know. Cool. Thanks everybody.